Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, which is the first session in a collaborative SAMHSA VA learning series entitled Celebrating and Elevating American Indian and Alaska Native Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families. Next slide. I'm Stacey Owens, and I serve as the Military and Veterans Affairs Liaison for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Uh, one of our initiatives at SAMHSA is to partner with VA on efforts to support community-based suicide prevention for the SMVF community. I'll turn it over to Cicely burroughs mcelwain to bring you greetings on behalf of VA and talk a little bit more about the history of this partnership. Thank you so much, Stacey, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, on behalf of all of our leadership here at the VA, we're really excited to kick off this three-part event, as Stacey mentioned. Uh, in particular, this event is really meaningful for us uh, because we're working together so collaboratively to try to build some new resources and uh, programmatic activities over the next year or so with our American Indian Alaska Native veteran communities. And so connecting with some of the experts that you'll hear over the next uh, three sessions is uh, one of the very first foundational steps that we were taking uh, to making some of this information, this really critical cultural uh, awareness possible for the groups that we work Work with now. We know that some of you have been connected to the collaborative efforts that VA and SAMHSA have done for many years, but if you haven't, let's take a look at the next slide just to hear a little bit about the history of the efforts that we have underway. In particular, we started back in 2018 when SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the VA partnered to really work on strategic Did Cicely freeze for others? I think she's frozen. Implementation of suicide prevention, both policy. Cicely, if you can try to oh, turn no. off your Sorry, camera, guys. that might give us better bandwidth. I'm doing that right now. Okay, how's that? Any better? That's better. If not, Okay, great. Um, so again, this is uh, the work that started back in 2018 collaboratively. We're really thrilled that we're able to continue that work. Today, uh, the governor's challenge has reached all 50 states and all five territories. We continue to look for new and innovative ways that we can support community-based suicide prevention efforts and uh, working with our American Indian Alaska Native tribes and Veteran Service Organizations is one of the areas that we're going to be focusing a lot of attention on in the upcoming months and years ahead. So thank you all again for joining us. Stacey, I'll hand it over to you to talk about some of the technical assistance opportunities we have underway. Thanks so much. Uh, this, this webinar, as well as the collaborative partnership with SAMHSA and VA, are supported by SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families Technical Assistance Center, uh, which we call the SMVFTA Center for short. Um, the TA Center uh, partners with states, territories, and communities to increase behavioral health support for the SMBF community. Uh, the TA Center does that through uh, strengthening military-civilian uh, collaboration, providing a centralized platform for jurisdictions to connect and share, increasing awareness of and access to resources for SMBF behavioral health, uh, supporting coordinated responses, as well as encouraging implementation of best and promising practices. Next slide, please. And uh, some of those technical assistance avenues include academies for jurisdictional teams, uh, crisis intercept mapping workshops for SMVF suicide prevention, webinars like this one, as well as other types of virtual learning opportunities, um, as well as connections with experts and dissemination of information and resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, working with the SMVFTA Center uh, is one of our consultants, Dean Dufanet. Uh, Dean is a veteran himself, and he has uh, really dedicated his life's work to supporting his fellow veterans. Uh, Dean will be our moderator today, and he's going to uh, take us through the rest of the agenda and carry us forward. Dean, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Stacy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dean Dufanet. I am a Marine Corps veteran. I'm also an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in North Dakota. I was born and raised on the Spirit Lake Nation Dakota Reservation. So my mother is Dakota and my dad is Ojibwe. So that's kind of how that, that all worked out. Uh, really 
honored to be with you all today, um, sharing on this very important, near and dear to my heart uh, topic um, of our of our history, proud history of service. And uh, I have the honor today of introducing um, our our speaker today, who is a fellow Marine Corps brother of uh, of mine, Mr. Gregorio Kishkitan. Um, he is serving as the staff advisor in the office of the Secretary of the United uh, Department of Veterans Affairs as the Native American and Alaska Native Liaison within the Center for Minority Veterans, where he serves as the PAC on the PACT Act Committee, Strong Act Committee, and the White House Committee on Native American Affairs. Uh, Kishkatan is a tribal elder with the Water Clan of the Kickapoo Tribe of Oklahoma and Comanche and Lipan Apache Tribe. Kishkatan previously served as contracting officer for the US, U.S. Department of Interior, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and Bureau of Indian Education. Kishkatan served in the United States Marine Corps in several roles and was honorably discharged in 1991. He is a lifetime member of the Marine Corps League and Disabled American Veterans. He's a graduate of Southern Arkansas University, the University of Texas, and the University of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma City Community College, where he is also a Hall of Famer, uh, being inducted into the whole Hall of Fame in 2018. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to his presentation, and uh, he has a wealth of knowledge. And I'm proud to call him uh, a brother of mine in arms and in this work that we're doing as advocates in the veteran space. So I'd like to turn it over to our venerated elder and brother, Gregorio Kishkitan. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, can I, um, let me let me go back to those slides just for a couple of housekeeping items. Sorry about that. Thanks for keeping me in, in line, everybody. Um, we have a disclaimer that we want to just uh, set off here that says that the views and opinions and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Veterans Affairs Health Administration, or the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And just as our virtual uh, attendees, there will be uh, questions to be answered, Q&A, the chat box will be disabled, but you can plot questions in there and we will try to get to those um, in real time as best we can, but I don't wanna interrupt the presentation. So we'll try to get those uh, as we go. And then just for your knowledge, the presentation and slides will be, uh, and the recording of this will be emailed to all the registrants following the session. Couple learning objectives that we that we want to touch on today, and that's to provide an overview of the history of military service among American Indian Alaska Native peoples, as well as emphasizing the importance of pra practicing cultural humility and trauma informed care. There we go. Now the, the now for the main event of the afternoon, Mr. Gregorio Kishkitan. Welcome, Thank sir. You. Thank you, Dean. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a presentation that I have given a number of times at colleges and universities and also <clears throat> with other federal agencies. And so I entitled it, The Transition of Native Lands and Reservations to Military Service and Public Servant. Uh, I put together this and I've had some uh, slides over the years, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the staff here in Washington, D.C. It's a very small force of people, as you see, uh, from very, uh, from very in agent, age, excuse me, very in, uh, military branches uh, of, of, uh, of the military, excuse me. Uh, and so um, we actually in the Center for Minority Veterans, we address the needs of not only just our Native American, Alaska Native people, but we also address the needs of African American people, uh, Asian, South Pacific, and Hawaiian, uh, Latino or Latin, and also the uh, LGBTQ uh, community as well. So this is our current staff. There's one person, two people that have left and retired since then. Uh, next slide, please. So playing the drum and carrying the Eagle Staff and wearing the Eagle Bonnet <clears throat> or War Bonnet is way of our tribes and paying respects for those 
uh, not only the elders, but people that have served in the military and have a distinguished career in the military. Uh, it's a way of, of honoring them when they come back, whether it be uh, overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, or wherever. Uh, but also those veterans that served uh, uh, and retired and so forth. So we try to pay homage. Uh, each individual tribe is different. Uh, and so we, we pay homage and, 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 and it's a privilege in showing respect to those individuals that have served in the military. So uh, the top pictures of myself, of course, uh, the uh, picture with the Eagle Staff was at the National Congress of American Indians in Alaska. And then the bottom picture is me drumming with one of the groups that I drummed with before, which is the Zotai Singers and the um, War Paint Singers and uh, the Uptown uh, Singers. Um, and this is also here, this emblem here is when I went to Alaska, I met the Alaskan Native Veterans Association members and it, it was really great meeting them. They're a very strong organization that uh, help uh, fight for the benefits and so forth for the Alaskan uh, natives. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I wanna talk about is Carlisle Indian School. And I put this in here because as I was telling uh, my colleagues at the beginning of the uh, presentation, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing a, um, a workshop next week at SAGE, which is the Society of American Indian Government Employees in Spokane, Washington. Uh, but I've had this in here for a while and there's a reason why. Um, <clears throat> a lot of my relatives, five in particular, were forced to attend Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My great grandfather, George Kishkaton Sr. was one of those students and he also was drafted into World War I. Uh, so, He's a, a World War, War World I veteran on my family's side. Um, and there's also other schools that I list here that my relatives were forced to attend, which is Concho and Riverside Indian Schools, both in Oklahoma City and Anadarko. Uh, what was I found interesting is if you look at the lower right picture, there's a two-star general I'm with, that's General Hill. Uh, Carlisle Indian School was changed into a the the Army War College, which I did not know this. Uh, I met Car uh, General, then Brigadier General in Dallas, Texas. I lived in Dallas, Texas for 13 years. And then I ran into him. So the picture in with four people is him back in Texas. And the one that's on the lower right is myself and he at AUSA last year. And so I just thought that might be interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are pictures of yours truly. Um, I served in the Marine Corps back in the day. Um, I went through uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California. Uh, I entered into boot camp December 10th of 1984 and graduated March the 1st of 1985. I was 0351 Dragon Weapon System crewman, which was basically a, um, a grunt. We call them grunts. Uh, but nevertheless, I enjoyed my time in the Marine Corps. I was uh, sent to the first Desert Storm pr prior to my being discharged from the military. And so I spent a little time over there and then I came home and I was discharged on a medical discharge. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is my father. My father's on the far right. Uh, both served in the army, that's my uncle Wilbur. Uh, my father served in Vietnam. He is no longer with us. He's been gone for about 23 years. Uh, my uncle Wilbur, who served in Korea, never came back. Um, so this just kind of gives you an idea and a long history of not just my family, but many families that have long lines and long history of Native Americans, families uh, literally serving in the military. And it doesn't end there. It continues on with my family in particular. So this is my father and my, my uncle. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is one of the duty stations I was stationed at prior to going to uh, Desert Storm. I was at Marine Barracks Naval Weapons Station, Concord, California. I was on a special detail that required a secret security clearance. Uh, essentially, 
I guess I could talk about it now because I'm no longer in, but we just, we were the ones that protected and guarded a lot of the nuclear weapons and Tomahawk and Scud missiles for the Pacific fleet. Next slide, please. Uh, I also went to Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California, uh, served in the 1st Marine Division. I was in weapons company at ITS, which is the infantry training school. Uh, again, I was a Dragon Weapons System crewman, which is no longer in use. I think it's been replaced by um, the Javelin, I think, or uh, something like that. Um, the Dragon Weapons System crewman was a wire-guided missile. It was uh, anti tank or anti-assault that had a 99.9% .9 chance of hitting its target. And so I spent my time there and met a lot of Native Americans and Native Hawaiians and, and so forth. And I had some really good friends when I, when I was stationed there. So uh, again, getting to know uh, the other tribes that, uh, that served, it's, it's really amazing because sometimes uh, during my career in the military, I felt like I was the only one, but when you meet other people, it, it makes it better. And it gives you an idea that there's other people uh, that are just as willing as you are to die for your country. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, family history. Um, my great, great grandfather, Papa, Pe uh, Papa Peche, he fought in the Civil War on the side of the blue coats. But I did find, because I'm, I'm one of these people that I, I, I uh, do a lot of research. I, it, it, if I'm not working, I'm usually doing some research on my family because me and my cousin are the ones that put the family tree together. I did find out that there was a couple of family members that, uh, that sided with the French. Uh, so I was a little disappointed, but yet not because it's part of history. Uh, my great grandfather, George Kishkaton Sr., as I said, he fought in World War I as an army rifleman. Uh, my grandfather, Dw uh, Dwight Kishkaton, fought in World War II as an army tanker. Uh, my father and my uncle fought in Vietnam and Korea. Uh, my uncle, George Whitewater, I forgot to put his name there, he was a paratrooper in, uh, in World War II as well. And he actually went to the uh, Kickapoos of Mexico and became the, tri uh, the chief of the Kickapoo tribe of Mexico and subsequently passed away there. Uh, and then myself. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a later picture of my uncle George Kishkaton. I forgot to say the previous picture was him in his gear uh, as a as a paratrooper. Uh, so there's uh, some information here. I don't want to read it verbatim, but it just talks about his history and uh, him becoming. Uh, uh, a member of the 127th Field Interse Inter Artillery, excuse me, and uh, the places that he served and so forth. And so I just wanted to put that information there, but I'm not going to read it verbatim. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the organizations, when I first started attending the National Congress of American Indians, uh, I always look to see if there's an organization or a group or a team or a committee within a larger organization like this one. Uh, the National Congress of American Indians was founded in 1944. It's one of the oldest uh, and largest of them and the most representative of American Indians and Alaskan Natives and organizations uh, serving the broad interests of tribal governments and communities and also our tribal veterans. Uh, I gave a presentation uh, one of, at one of their meetings, I can't remember which one it was, but it's been some time ago. And uh, I was able to talk about the PACT Act, the Strong Act, and the no co pays for Native Americans. Um, so it's nice, like I said, it's nice to go to these organizations and find there's uh, tribal or, excuse me, uh, veteran organizations within. And it's also nice to go to tribal governments and see that they have uh, tribal, uh, uh, tribal committees as well. Next slide, please. Uh, during this overview, um, okay. uh, during the Native American Removal Act of eight, uh, May 30th of 1830 and the Trail of Tears of Courses, there's a lot of history there. And there was a question that I have been, always been asked and I've always asked it in this way or answered, excuse me. Uh, 
a lot of people in my journeys um, at powwows and things like that, because I'm very proud Marine, so I'll, I'll wear my Marine hat or whatever. And they say to me, um, how could you serve in a country that tried to eliminate your people? And it's very clear to me, uh, and it's uh, other people that I talk to feel, feel the same way that are Native American. And that is, is that, you know, we, we were, we've had to fight for it once before. And for us to, if we had to fight again against another foreign power, uh, there's a lot of things going on in the world. We would still fight because this is our land. This is our, this is Turtle Island. This is where our people are from. And why would we not fight for it again? You know, our ancestors are laid to rest here. You know, so that's that's my answer to one of the questions and that I've always been asked. Um, the uh, Na Native American in Military Service and New Memorial in Washington, D.C. was dedicated November the 11th of 2022. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And I think that's where we see, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a different slide. Um, so let's let's talk about Native American Heritage Month because that's coming up in November. I'm already planning for mine because I have two virtual events and one live event at uh, VA central offices. Um, it's a time that we celebrate our heritage and our, and our culture and so forth. Uh, there are currently, I believe, 574 federally recognized tribes uh, if I'm incorrect, uh, please, I apologize, um, that identify as American Indian and Alaska Native. Um, tribal, uh, recognizing the government-to-government -government relationships with the United States is very important. Uh, we're talking about tribal sovereignty. It's tribal sovereignty, but it's also sovereignty amongst our nations and also with our veterans who play a big part and a big role of, of a lot of tribal governments. Uh, once they leave the military and they become civilians again, uh, like myself, I'm very active in the Kickapoo tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, my intentions are when I retire in three years is to run for the chief chairman of, that, of my tribe. Um, so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So uh, it, everybody's, I'm sure, if you're not familiar, this is the Trail of Tears. Uh, and during that era, during that time, about the time of the Indian Removal Act, there was a lot of tribes that uh, were forced, marched in extreme cold weather and so forth. And in particular, the five civilized tribes of Oklahoma, let me see if I can remember them, I'm from Oklahoma, uh, Chick, uh, Cherokee, uh, Cherokee, Choctaw, Choctaw Chickasaw, Seminole and Creek. Uh, they were the major players, but there were additional tribes as well that were involved in the Trail of Tears. Uh, if you're ever in question, and I always tell this because people this because a lot of people ask me, you know, how can I find out uh, who I'm related to or how, how would I find out if my family was on the Trail of Tears? There is a, what's called the Dawes Road. And if you go to the Dawes Road, uh, org, uh, you can uh, search actually for names or people that were on the Trail of Tears. And I talk about this because this is one of those pivotal times in American history and also uh, Native American history that um, made a huge impact on us as people. And uh, also the Indian uh, Relocation Act of 1830. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of tribes, we're on reservations, we're on reservations still today. Uh, the Kickapoo tribe of Oklahoma is one of the tribes that uh, had a reservation up to a certain point and then they basically done away with it. So my ancestors were given land, they were called Alatis. Um, there are 326 Indian reservations in the United States and 574 recognized tribes. Uh, the largest Indian reservation in the United States is the Navajos. Uh, at one point, they were up to 220,000 members. They're now about 325,000 members, uh, followed by the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Cherokee Nations, uh, and the Unata and Ure reservations in, in Utes in Utah. So <clears throat> these are examples of the um, 
the uh, lands that were given to me by uh, when my father died in 1994, we went to uh, to a um, probate. It was an administrative law judge that administered the probate since it was Native American lands. And so if you see the names that I have circled that I can't pronounce, um, I have researched these names and I found them. Uh, and it talks, I have the records where they were given the land and so forth. So until this up until this day, we still have this land. We have four plots of land in Oklahoma and one in Horton, Kansas. And the reason why Horton, Kansas is because Horton, Kansas is where the Kansas Kickapoos are. So that's just a little bit of information there. If you're, you know, I just wanted to bring this as an example so people can see and also stress that not all Native Americans were on uh, reservations uh, back in the day. Next slide, please. Uh, interesting facts. Uh, in 1914, uh, Reverend Red Fox, James traveled, and this always astounded me when I looked up these facts, 4,000 miles to Washington, D.C. to petition the president for a day to honor Native Americans. Can you imagine 4,000 miles probably on a horse. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Uh, but nevertheless, that was a long ways to travel back then. In 1968, California Governor Ronald Reagan designated that the fourth Friday of September as American Indian Day. And that happens during, uh, right there before uh, Native American Heritage Month. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush designated November a whole month as National American Indian Heritage Month. So think about all those all these dates and times that we have to, um, to basically pay homage to our, our, our tribes and our families and our heritage and cultures that have, have, have left us. And they've left us with a, a, a very rich knowledge. Um, one of the events that I've gotten involved with that is it's become a very big event. This is our third year doing it, and it grows every year, is the powwow at the, the Pentagon. And so uh, I usually help bring in the drum or bring in dancers and so forth. And and um, it's, it's really a great event. I mean, uh, you know, it gets bigger every year. And so I think it's a very great opportune time in particular that the Pentagon would pay uh, pay respects to uh, its members that have served and and uh, and those that have served and and not came back. Next slide. And I wanted to talk briefly about Native American leaders. Uh, you know, just like any culture, we look up to people that you know emulate or uh, are people that we can look up to and just you know respect because they've had a hard road just like the rest of us and they had their sights set on certain jobs, positions or what have you. So the first one is Deb Holland. Um, I left the interior before she became the interior, Secretary of the Interior. She's the first Native American uh, to serve in, in a United States cabinet level position. Uh, the second one is uh, Elizabeth uh, Pet, uh, Peretrovich. Uh, she was the first person in Alaska uh, Native American heritage to be featured on the United States currency, which was a, a dollar uh, gold coin. Uh, Wes Studi, who, who I've met, is one. Of, he also was a veteran. Uh, is the first person of Native American heritage to earn an honorary award from the Academy Awards. And so, if you know about uh, Mr. Studi's uh, long list of movies he's been involved in, you know he's been very involved in and has. Uh, you know, um, had a lot of roles in movies and, and shows and things. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is one thing that I wanted to talk about because when we think of cold talkers, we think of the Navajo cold talkers. And I have the utmost deepest respect for the remaining three that are living. I've met several of them and I went to to say Bonito when they did the groundbreaking for the Code Talkers Museum and near Albuquerque. And so <clears throat> this 
uh, talks about the World War I. World War I was when the first time that we used cold talkers and the, they came from the Miswaki tribes, uh, the um, Choctaw tribes, uh, oh, here's the other ones. Um, the, the, not a list of the tribes there. Okay, I don't think I have all of them. Uh, but anyway, so these are the gentlemen uh, uh, that were the first code talkers. Uh, and, you know, like I said, they, uh, they did uh, the code and everything back then in World War I. And I just feel like that they were overlooked or they've been overlooked. So I wanted to include this in the presentation to remind people <clears throat> that there were other code talkers. And also in addition, when the Navajo gold talkers were doing cold as well, there were other tribes during, uh, during World War II that did cold, talk, uh, cold talking as well. Uh, next slide, please. Gregorio, I'll just would jump in there and give a quick rapid fire of some of the tribes that were also code talkers outside of yeah. the Navajo, which were, you did mention some of them, Choctaw, Comanche, Cherokee, Muskegee, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota, Nisquaki, Seminole, Hopi, Assiniboine, Ojibwe and Oneida, just to name exactly. a few. Thank and you. One point, I like to make one point about World War I a lot, uh, Gregorio, and that is the fact that, you know, this was in the the uh, 1910s, around there, 1914 time frame, I think. And this was a time when we as Native Americans didn't even have a right to vote yet until the exactly. Indian Citizenship Act happened in 1924. Um, and I looked at some data and it showed that there was a over 12,000 natives that served during World War I honorably, proudly, uh, at a time when we couldn't even vote in the country's affairs yet. So that's a little, since we're on the fun facts, or uh, I'd like to share that too. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and that is very important um, <clears throat> to, to know that during that time that we, we, we didn't even have the right to vote, uh, but yet we fought in a war where we had less uh, rights than most other people, if not all. And so, but we still fought. And that goes back to that say, uh, that ide ideology I have, or that idea that I said, you know, I would fight for my country regard regardless because this is the land of my people. So why would I not fight? You know, I, I have an obligation. Next slide. Hey, Gregorio, um, yeah. on that topic, we got a couple questions. We we're, we're gonna hope to field them on the run. Are you up for that right now? Are yeah. Okay. So one question is, how do the Code Talkers Museum in Tuba City, Arizona, compare to the one you mentioned in Albuquerque? That's one question. And then, then there's an, another question about what did the Code Talkers do? I know you and I are kind of historians in that respect. So we like to, uh, so not everybody knows about the Code Talkers. So the um, a museum in Tuba City is a smaller museum. It The one in, in, in to say Bonito was actually funded half by the federal government and half by donations, just like the uh, the uh, uh, monument there at the um, Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. Uh, it was funded by the half by the federal government. So it, it made it kind of like a national museum rather than just a regional museum. And so <clears throat> a lot of the, the, the stuff that was put in the museum and so forth uh, was really um, taken at the uh, recommendations or uh, the approval of the existing code talkers that are still alive. And so it's more of a well-rounded museum. Again, it's more of a national museum. And what was the other question? I'm sorry. Well, yeah. What did the code talkers do or what did, you know, what was so significant about that? What's significant about the code talkers in particular, and we're going to just say all of them, but okay, let's say the, the, the Navajos, because they did save the country, uh, really, um, is from what I understand from talking to several of the code talkers that are alive, um, they use their Navajo language, their Diné language. But what they did is they took things that would mean something different, uh, like plane, they'd say maybe bird or tank, they'd say tortoise or something like that. And I'm not giving you the exact samples, but I'm just saying this is what they did. So what they did, number one, the Japanese could not break the code. Uh, secondly, uh, when actually the, their own 
tribal people couldn't break the code because they weren't familiar with the military jargon, first of all. Um, but the code doctors themselves, uh, you know, they went to school uh, to learn how to do this. And they came up with this, this plan of how to identify certain things and call in firepower and how they use uh, everyday Diné words, Navajo words, but it in when it came to the war, it meant something else. So the code was never broken. And that's why. And that's why I said some of their own people, the Diné people, did not know what the codes meant because they changed the meaning of, of things that they used. Were you going to say something, Dean? No, oh, yeah, I was just going to say that it was, um, you know, the code itself was faster and more reliable than the medic mechanical encryption that they had at the time that, you know, it, and that they provided the tactical advantage. That's the big, that was kind of the differentiator with the code talkers and the ability to, to send the, that code uh, that was indecipherable. So that Most was definitely. Really, really big stuff. Most definitely. And, and, you know, you do give the Navajo uh, tribe and the Navajo code talkers their respect and their props because um, being that the code was never broken, that's how we won the war. Um, and most of the gentlemen that I've met, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Ken, uh, Kinzel, uh, and I forget the other one's name. Um, I think it's Mr. Begay. Um, they're very um, modest about what they did. They, 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 they're, it's just amazing. They're amazing the people to speak with. You know, If you ever get the chance to talk to any veteran of any war, especially the older veterans. Like when I first started my jo job with the VA uh, in two, two, uh, 25 years ago, I met a World War I veteran, uh, Mr. Graves. And I, on my breaks, I would go sit and just talk to him because I wanted to hear, excuse me, hear from uh, first language or firsthand knowledge what happened, you know? You can't get that from a, a textbook. And so I would sit for, with him for hours on end and just listen to his stories, you know. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I thought I had a picture of here at the museum. Uh, so um, this, the center picture is uh, last year's uh, Native American Heritage po poster that I had. Uh, like I said, I'll have two events this year and that are virtual and one live, which we've selected a date of November 13th. Um, anybody's welcome to come to it. Again, this is another po uh, picture of the uh, uh, World War I code talkers. I, I guess I should have reread this. I forget what I wrote. The Choctaw Telephone Squad return of Barney Owen Brunner, 1919. So it gives you some information about the Choctaw code talkers in particular. And, and again, here is the additional languages that Dean said, these are the additional tribes uh, that uh, spoke or did code talking as well during World War I. And uh, if you look on the bottom right picture, uh, that's Minnie uh, Spotted, uh, is it Minnie, Minnie Spotted Owl? Uh, she was the first Native American Marine. Uh, Spotted Wolf, I think it is, yeah. Spotted Wolf, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so next slide, please. Okay, <clears throat> so the gentleman at the top right being awarded the Medal of Honor is Mr. Dwight uh, Birdwell. Uh, I, I've worked with Stephanie Birdwell here at VA Central Offices. She was the uh, she was the um, executive director for the uh, Office of Tribal Government Relations, and he won his award uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, it was like he spoke. He has spoken at so many events. Uh, he's such a, a a wonderful man. He's from Oklahoma as well uh, as as uh, as well as I am. Um, Native people have served uh, for the same reasons as anyone else uh, to demonstrate patriotism and pursue employment, education, or adventure. Uh, many were drafted, like a lot of my ancestors. Yet tribal warrior traditions, treaties, uh, commitments with the United States and responsibility for defending native homelands have also inspired to an enduring legacy of indig indigenous military service. The, the 
Native American population is the largest population by far of any minority group that has has veterans that have served in the military or currently served. Um, when I went to Marine Corps boot camp, my senior drill instructor said to me, you know, some of my best uh, Marines were Native Americans, you know, and that really meant a lot to me, you know. Of course, I was a lot younger and a lot thinner and I could run like the wind. I mean, I they had me running everywhere. Uh, but you know what? Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, um, like I said, we, we, we have a common bond as Native American veterans. Um, and we, there's a brotherhood that's unbreakable. And not only that with, but with most, with all branches of the military, but in particular the Marine Corps, I'm not trying to be partial to the Marine Corps, but the brotherhood is different. And Dean can tell you that. Uh, next slide, please. Natives American service. Uh, and I think this is some more information I was talking about. According to the Department of Defense, American Indians, Alaska Natives have one of the highest representations in the armed forces. VA, VA consults with American Indian and Alaska Na Native tribal governments to develop partnerships that enha enhance access to services and benefits by veterans and their families. VA is committed to ensuring that Native American veterans and their families are able to utilize benefits and services they entire, are entitled to and receive. And very briefly, I wanna talk about two benefits uh, that Native Americans are entitled to. The one, first one I'm gonna talk about, and I said on the committee where we instituted or put the, the bill together from Congress, which is the no co-pays for Native Americans. A lot of people say, well, why do Native Americans don't have to pay co-pays? There's, there was a reason because the Senator realized in Congress that uh, we had an MOU with IHS, Indian Health Services. And he posed a question to our VA leadership and said, why do veterans that go to IHS don't have, why do they not have to pay co-pays there, but yet they pay co-pays at the VA. So that is how that all got started. And two years later or so, the <clears throat> legislation went through, we instituted, we decided what kind of paperwork was gonna be required to determine if they were Native American along with the application and so forth. And so far it's been a very successful program. So if you're Native American and you're not getting uh, your benefits uh, under that act for no co-pays, uh, please reach out to me or somebody or look it up on the internet, but you're always welcome to reach out to me and I'll send you the form. It goes to West Virginia and you provide them with your CDIB card, which is certificate degree of Indian blood or a letter from your tribe that states that you are Native American. Uh, also too, the second one I'm gonna talk about is something that we're still going through right now, which is called the Strong Act. And if you're not familiar with the Strong Act, the Strong Act deals with the uh, inequalities uh, when it comes to mental health, uh, as long as also as the Native American Alaska Native Liaison, I, I oversee 206 people nationwide uh, with the MVPC program, which is called the Minority Veteran Program. Um, they, um, and that's the four territories as well. And so we, we took the re legislation from Congress about a year and a half ago or so, and we're almost to the point we're ready to report them to them that we've completed it. We solicited the help with IHS and HHS. Uh, we put together training in our what we call our talent man talent management system TMS uh, that is required training for our CMVs and our MVPCs, excuse me, and um, <clears throat> and also their their um, their um, their uh, action plans that they have to submit. Now they have to get with their suicide prevention coordinator and they put together an uh, action plan and then I review it and then I set it up for approval. So those are some things that ha are going on in, our, in native country and, and with our veterans. And so if you're unfamiliar with those, uh, please, like I said, reach out to me. I always love helping people if they're unfamiliar with any kind of benefits or if they have questions. And if I can't get the answer, I can tell you, or if I don't know the answer, I can get you the answer. Um, so uh, again, this is a picture of my uh, my uh, uncle, George Whitewater, uh, when, towards the end of his life when he was chief of the Kickapoos of Mexico. Next slide. 
<clears throat> Here's the picture I was thinking of. I love this picture. I, I don't know if I took that picture or not. It's been so long ago. Uh, so 2013, Congress passed legislation for the National Museum of American Indian, uh, NAMI, to create a National Native American Veterans Memorial. Um, and it was dedicated November 11th of 2022. I was on the original committee and then I moved back to Texas and then came back. Uh, so this is myself, uh, the Honorable Dennis McDonough, the Secretary of the VA, my predecessor, uh, she was a, a part of the Seneca Nation. And then uh, that's one of my other Marine Corps brothers I worked at the BIA with, um, uh, Lance Fisher. Uh, and he was also, like I said, a Marine. And so I love it when they have it lit up at night. They don't have it lit up every night. But in the center of the eye, it's, a, it's supposed to be lit up with a flame. Uh, but it's not always that, that way. Uh, Juanita Mullen, because I was trying to think of her name. Juanita Mullen is the one that was my predecessor. Uh, she held this position for 17 years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is the flag uh, uh, honor guard. Uh, I actually filled in at a very last minute notice. I was walking onto the floor of, of NACI, uh, National Congress of American Indians. And they said, are you a veteran? I said, yes. And they said, would you help us with color guard? I said, sure. You know, uh, we, I've already told you about the National Congress of American Indian. The second organization I belong to is in Washington, D.C. is the uh, American Indians. Uh, it's a, the Society of American Indians was established in 1966. Uh, they're active, but they're not as active as NACI. Uh, and, but they're another organization that looks out for Native Americans and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to put this in here because this gentleman is part of uh, Dean's tribe, uh, which is the Ojibwe. Um, his name is Jason Dunbar. Um, uh, he is, was part of Army Delta Force. Uh, I'm very good friends with his mother now. Um, people reach out to us or be in particular uh, in, in my role, they always want me to come to events. And so I went to this event in Wisconsin on the Ojibwe nation there. Um, I think it's called the Badlands or something like that. I can't remember the entire name. Um, and so Mr. Uh, Dunbar uh, was killed in action in Syria and uh, his mother started an organization uh, for veterans that were suffering from PTSD, MST and, um, and uh, uh, head trauma. Um, <clears throat> so she invited me and I went to this um, retreat, if you will. Um, and it was uh, a whole week on Lake Superior and I had never been on Lake Superior. And I, I didn't even know that the, this tribe in particular harvested their own rice. Um, so I found out a lot about this tribe and I just fell in love with these people. And, um, you know, when I came home after this event with them, it's the first time I'd ever taken a vacation and felt like that I actually had a vacation. And I, I'll just be honest with you, you know, I suffer from PTSD as well and MDD. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I have my own moments like everybody else that suffers from PTSD. And, but to have an organization like this that services Native Americans and they don't, they don't discriminate. They, just cause you're a Native American, she doesn't, Linda Dudmore, his mom doesn't, she, allows everybody to come, but it was primarily started as a Native American uh, nonprofit to, uh, in her son's name, to, uh, to do this. Next slide, please. Why we serve. I found out I am not only fighting for the little bitty pieces or piece of a land I talk about or my immediate family. I found out I was fighting for all the Indian people, all the people of the United States. And this is Samuel Sasso. He's one of the Navajo code talkers. He wrote that. And the gentleman in the Eagle um, um, regalia is uh, my, my uncle George Whitewater. Next slide, please. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah, we just had a question come in um, and I would 
was trying to find the right way to to interject it in there, but uh, just we'll just ask it as and, and do our best with answering this. And it's it's a question saying that we are Native warriors and we have ceremonies and traditional healing practices um, for healing and well being. Will the VA ever recognize these practices for benefits and services? Uh, they also co uh, commented that they, I think this is needed. Many of my veterans on Navajo use them practices instead of Western medicine. Great question. <clears throat> Thank you for asking that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have already started. We have 14 VA facilities that have uh, sweat lodges and um, talking circles and that does smudging. I, I went and did a smudging. <clears throat> Excuse me. I went and did a smudging ceremony at the uh, DCVA Medical Center last year. So we already have that in place. As a matter of fact, the Strong Act, which, I, uh, which addressed uh, mental health in our Native communities, we already have uh, SOPs in place for other VA medical centers that want to do the same. Uh, that was the whole reason for the training, too, is our mental health uh, professionals us, the Office of Tribal Government Relations and the Office of Tribal Health ran by Dr. Prairie Chicken, all that training in TMS was put together so that we know how to deal with the additional or uh, other remedies. In other words, our the way that our tribes deal with, you know, these things, mental health and so forth. Um, so they've come a long way. Um, I remember years ago, when I had left VA for the first time uh, and I went to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and they wanted me to come back and this is before, way before the Strong Act, they wanted me to do a presentation about alternative uh, medicines or alternative ways of dealing with, with, with trauma. And so I did. And that was the first time that I think anybody had ever addressed that to VA. Uh, I subsequently came back to VA and then years later, here I am sitting, realizing that we are now addressing those remedies as part of our ways of our Native American veterans to deal with you know, PTSD, MST, TBI, and so forth. So all those things that you've asked, and thank you again for asking, we already have in place. We have 14 facilities um, that have already, you know, already have the sweat lodges, already have the talking circles, already have all that in place. And we're trying to move that out to the other facilities as we, the Strong Act continues to, to grow. That's a okay. great point. So I think uh, maybe for, for that person who asked that, um, how would they go about finding the SOPs that they could take to VA and ask if they can implement that kind of a setup there? Uh, if they'll send me an email, I'll see if I can provide them with the SOPs. Do they, are they VA employee? Is it a VA employee? I, I can't tell. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, in the, at, at the end of the presentation, you'll see my contact information. And I'll see if I can release that information to you. I don't want to release it unless I can, because uh, you know how the government is. Uh, so I'll see if I can release the SOPs to you. So just send me an email. Okay, so right here in front of us, we have a picture of the first Pentagon powwow that uh, I went to when the Pentagon reached out to me and said, we want to collaborate. So most of those people, or some of them are the Kiowa uh, Black Legging Society. Um, and there's a couple of my friends, uh, a couple of the uh, warrior princesses and so forth. Uh, there was a lot of people there. It was a great event. Uh, the poster on the right was their poster from 2023. So that was the first year. 2024 was, no, we're in 2024. Uh, that was the second year, excuse me. And so that was their poster. I really love that poster. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so this was the, the big ceremony that they had where they had a parade and everything for the dedication of the, um, the monument for uh, Native Americans in military service. This is a picture of our illustrious leader, uh, Mr. Dennis 
uh, the Honorable Dennis McDonough that spoke. Uh, these are pictures of all the flags, the tribal nation flags that line the area where you came in. And uh, they, had a, they had a parade uh, since it was the inaugural or the unveiling. Uh, the two events happened uh, one, the Pentagon happened one day and the next day the, this happened. So uh, there was a lot of Native Americans here in Washington, D.C. And it was just an amazing time to see everybody, you know, proud and out there. I actually walked with uh, the family of Ira Hayes. Um, if you don't know who Ira Hayes is, Ira Hayes is one of the Native Americans. I think he was Pima. Um, he uh, he um, was one of the Marines that raised the flag at Iwo Jima. So that Iwo Jima statue you see in DC and the picture, he's one of the Marines that helped raise that flag at Iwo Jima. And I was so blessed and so honored to meet his family. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of one of my, one of my little plugs. And it's the reason why I mentioned this is because I was talking to a gentleman, Mr. Lassar. He was part of the White House uh, on Native American Affairs uh, when I was on that group. And I, we were talking and, and, and I was telling that I was, I sat on a board of trustees for uh, St. Olive's University, which is the HBCU. And he said, you know what? I goes, I think you're the first Native American that's ever sat on a HBCU board. Now he had sat on the board for Howard University Medical School, but he said the first HBCU Board of Trustees. So I'm very proud of this, and I'm I apologize if I've been anybody that couldn't in there. But you know, uh, it, I served for four years. I was very happy to have served, and you know, it just gives you an example that as Native Americans, that we we're not just we're not just stuck on a reservation anymore. That our lives as, 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 as Native Americans have started to change and we're going outside our communities and so forth and we're becoming more involved in, in other areas. And you, you see that with, the, uh, with people that act and sing and things like that. And you know, it's just amazing how we have kind of come into the new century and said, you know, here we are, we're Native, we're proud and you know, we're doing wonderful things. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I've already spoke about this. This is my father. My, I don't. I need to redo this. And uh, my my uncle. Uh, now, this is a picture that I'm really very proud that I found. Uh, if you look on the National Archives, this came from the National Archives. And like I said, I just do research everywhere I can. Uh, this picture is of my great grandfather, my great grandmother. Both George Sr. and Mary Murdoch Kishkaton both attended Carlisle. George Kishkaton Sr. Uh, Jr. is on the far right. And then uh, uh, Mary Murdoch, uh, her daughter. Uh, so this is circa 1910 uh, from Oklahoma in an old Oklahoma house there. And it's just a great picture. When I found it, I was so happy. Um, I also, by doing research, I found a recording at UC Berkeley of my great grandparents and they were uh, doing a recording. They would ask them how to say certain things in their language. So um, I found that and was able to hear their voices because uh, obviously they had passed before, uh, you know, before I was born. Next, next slide, please. Uh, this is my information. This is my great grandmother and me. Um, uh, this is my information. Uh, uh, my email address is gregorio.kishkaton2 at va.gov. Uh, so if you have any questions that you didn't want to ask here, or if you have any questions uh, or needed information or whatever, feel free to reach out to me. I, I do respond. Uh, I, I don't like it when people don't respond to me. So I make sure I respond to people when they contact me. Um, so that's my information. Um, I think that's it. Is Next slide. You definitely have some questions and activities, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, which we've got, we've got, we've got, seems like we've got plenty of time for that. So uh, you just okay. let me know if you're, if you're ready for them yeah. or how you'd like to. Most definitely. Just real quick in these pictures, that's 
George Kishkatan Jr., the, other, the gentleman that was in the picture with my great grandfather. And this is me when I worked in Texas at VA Valley Coastal Bend Healthcare System. And I put together a Native American Heritage Month with my other tribe, which is the Lepon Apache. Uh, they're in the Valley in Texas. Uh, next slide. And this is Mr. McDonald. This is this is this guy here. He's amazing. Uh, he's uh, one of the younger of the three that's still living, um, uh, and he is very talkative. So I'm hoping that I can either get him on uh, to come here or to be virtual at my virtual at my uh, in person event, and we just put him on the the screen or whatever. But uh, I've met him several times, and you know it just you know how you meet people and they just salute. Um, just a certain energy. And if, when you walk away, you just feel so good about yourself. This is the way this gentleman is. And so this was at the museum here in Washington, DC that came down for an inaugural event. I think that's it for questions. Yeah, so we had a follow-up question regarding the traditional healing practices um, that are used by VHA. The question was asked of how do we get the VBA to recognize and use to adjudicate our claims? That's a good question. <clears throat> we were just actually talking about that earlier in our, my, our CMV meeting. We have, <clears throat> we have a CMV meeting every Tuesday with and the entire staff uh, in the office of the secretary. And we addressed, <clears throat> excuse me, we addressed, um, there was an issue, let's just say a year ago or so with the African-Americans, our counterparts with their claims and how they're being adjudicated, how they're being paid and how they're being paid lesser of a percentage versus our white counterparts. And so I even posed that question today, believe it or not. And I said, well, what about us Native Americans? Because, you know, I, we kind of feel, and I've talked to other veterans and all these events I go to that say, you know, I got denied again, or they only gave me 10% or something like that. So I think that somewhere coming down the road, because there is a lawsuit, uh, that we are gonna be able to address those issues. We have already addressed them internally, uh, and that's all I can say, um, but we are starting to address these issues and see about you know changing the way that we adjudicate and process claims. I will, so, um, I can offer just a little bit of, uh... Um, food for thought on that. So I, I failed to mention that I'm also on the Secretary of Veterans Affairs Tribal Advisory Committee. So as of uh, just, I think, three years ago now, there's a direct line between Native veteran leadership and Secretary of VA's office, which is a, it's a big deal. It's historical. Um, so now Secretary of VA is taking direction directly from these committees on things that he is the champion out there in regards to Native veterans. So one thing I would say, depending on where you're at in the um, in the country, so I'm my coverage area is Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So those three states. So each <laughs> each of the states has a, a TAC committee member, tribal advisory committee member. I would say to um, you know you can or you know you can shoot those those questions to me as well. And I can power that out to those folks as my, my team members on the committee. Uh, but that's one route to go as well. Uh, matter of fact, so I chair the benefits subcommittee. Uh, it's a benefits and cemetery subcommittee, actually. So anything under those um, topics, we can bring those to our subcommittee meetings, uh, talk about them as a, as a group, see if they have merit to be elevated to secretary of uh, VA as recommendations. And that's how we interact with secretary of VA now. So we take, you know, um, about a year to meet, discuss, um, do research on many issues. And then we bring those to Secretary of VA in the form of formal recommendations. And the first wave of recommendations, I want to say there was about 13 to 15 recommendations. Almost all of them were out, either outright um, concurred with, con there was concurrence with them. Or there was a concurrence, um, how was it phrased? Concurred in principle. So generally speaking, they concur with the recommendation. 
However, you know, the details of how that, you know, plays out as far as the remedy, um, you know, may, maybe there's some things to work out there. So I just wanted to also spend a little time sharing that those are some outlets as well. I know we always, we, we get a guy as knowledgeable uh, like Gregorio on the hook and we like, want to give him every question and query from every angle. <laughs> I'm sure you get that a lot, but, but, but you're right. But there's, there's, a, there's other avenues. There's a, other avenues is, is the point of that, uh, that comment there. So um, yeah. just wanted to share well, that. And thank you uh, team for sharing that because it is, <clears throat> very insightful information that a lot of people don't know that we have the uh, tribal advisory committee. We also have a center for minority veterans advisory committee as well. And so uh, same situation, same scenario. Um, they take recommendations from veterans and so forth or groups, VSOs, what have you. And uh, they'll determine whether or not they need to be presented to the secretary as recommendations. Uh, and a lot of times, <clears throat> as Dean said, you know, things do change, but, you know, there are all, also, and I don't know what all facilities they have them at, because I've been to the uh, Tribal Veteran Service Officer training. Um, there are uh, TV, VSO, TVOs, is that what they're called? Tribal Veteran, Tribal Veterans Officer. Something like TV, that. TVS, um, there's there's TVSOs in some parts. Those are tribal veteran service officers. And yeah. I think uh, on the West Coast, you have TVRs, tri tribal veteran reps. Yeah, yeah, the, the TV, yeah. And so so those are people that have knowledge too that could probably help you on a more one-on-one uh, -on -one level. Uh, Dean could help you on uh, changing things on more of a grand scheme of things, so. Uh, and then anytime you need help from my office on anything, if you're having issues at a VA or whatever, and I had a huge uh, case just recently that got settled regarding two, uh, two uh, Vietnam veterans that were 100% disabled and so forth, and they were treated, weren't being treated fairly. And so I had to intercede. And that's part of my job, too, is I intercede for it veterans in the Native American Alaska Native community. But again, I don't discriminate. If a veteran comes to me for help, I help them. I don't care who you are. I, if you need help, I'm gonna help you, you know? And so what other questions do we have? So we have um, some comments here uh, about their tribal liaisons and the difficulty in distributing information to everyone. That is a common theme. Um, and so, you know, just a couple of, couple of points on where to get your information specifically for native vets, right? We're, we're trying to make some efforts to be able to get information specific to our native vets, disseminated directly to our native vets. Um, and we're hoping that our, our partners at NCAI can kind of develop into that hub of information dissemination because of their long and proud history of advocacy work. Yes. Um, so they're, they're going through, through some changes right now. So the hope is that uh, through quarterly newsletters or whatever the case may be, we find some ways to be able to communicate and and um, get a lot of the download, a lot of this information out there because there's stuff like we didn't really even touch on stuff like Native American direct loan as well, where you can, yeah. if you're living on trust land on the reservations or a lot of them are on trust land, you can buy a home or you can build a home with the VA's zero down home loan option. And that has a 2.5% interest rate now, right now approved until I think at least 2025. So, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a, I used the VA home loan benefit myself as a native vet, and it was a game changer for me in terms of my personal financial outlook. And it helped me really level up. One of the reasons we also serve, I feel like, is because we're in pursuit of that American dream as well. You know, we, and one of the pillars of the American dream is what it's home ownership, right? Uh, yes. So there's, there are some, there's some tools out there, some benefits out there that uh, I really like to bang that drum and, and highlight those because I think they're really being underutilized. We, we get the data on that. And some of these benefits are, are grossly underutilized with our native vet population. I, I'm looking at a, <clears throat> some questions, and this one didn't get answered. It's from Missy Meyer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, she said she's done claims for Navajo 
and have had to write many pages of narratives for PTSD claims um, and so forth. Um, if you're in the Albuquerque area, uh, I have two perfect people for you. I just got back from Gathering the Nations and I had a booth there with five other people, several from, or three from BBA, two from VHA, and then myself and my, my other colleague here. And so I know a couple of people there that do claims. And, and when I have questions, I go to them. Uh, so if you'll send me an email <clears throat> at gregorio.kishkatan2 at pa.gov, I'll get you in contact with uh, Lisa Pino or Samira Hattie. Uh, and they'll be more than happy to help you if you have any issues with any of your PTSD claims. Um, I had a couple discussion topics here, Gregorio, for you to, um, so this is under kind of a topic of, of challenges in Indian country. Can you talk about some of the unique challenges that American Indian veterans face in accessing be behavioral health care? Yes, definitely. Um, what I see is that, <clears throat> number one, we have a difficulty with those veterans that are in those remote areas uh, that may not have a, a smartphone, they may not have a computer, they may not have internet access, and the nearest facility is hundreds of miles away. Um, they've been working on putting up more uh, communications towers and using others to make sure that they have access to uh, the online or the virtual appointments. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is, is that, you know, um, we need to make sure that we have, for those people that can get to a facility, that we have either IHS or VA available to them. Uh, because I've heard a lot of veterans say, well, I, I would go to a facility, but, you know, I don't, either I don't know how to access it or I, you know, it, it may be far. There's a lot of obstacles that you hear with our rural veterans and we have a rural engagement office, but I think sometimes that the information as somebody was saying earlier, how the information isn't disseminated uh, to uh, the Native American veterans. Uh, and there is times that that happens, especially with the medical phase. You, you'd be surprised how many events I went to not to get off the subject. Uh, and I tell people, you know, and give them the papers and say, well, have you applied for no copays yet? They've never heard of that. they never heard of it. They didn't even know about it. So I think that for us, it's, it's, it's more or less trying to get on the same page. And that seems to be a constant, you know, it's always, you know, you, know, you always hear that. How come we can't be on the same page, you know? And it's difficult, it really is. And I understand the frustration, especially with my, um, my Alaska Native veterans, you go out there and they're, it's even worse, you know, because they're, they're in areas that you can only get in by a helicopter or a little plane, you know, and they are very frustrated. And so um, I'm hoping that in the future that we, you know, can do better. You know, I, like I said, when I went to uh, uh, Gathering Nations, I know it's hard for everybody to get to it. Nobody, not everybody can go to Gathering Nations, but we saw over a thousand veterans uh, in just a two day period. And we did intent to files. We did, we signed them up for uh, benefits. We did increase in disability. Uh, I'm an expert with NCA because I worked for NCA at the, in the field and at NDC. I've worked for VHA in the field and NDC. And now I work for the office of the secretary. So I myself have information that I can share with people. And I think that's most important is that when we go to these big uh, events like this, we need to also keep in mind that we have people out there that are sitting there waiting for us to reach out to them. I have one more, I think we're looking to do one more question, Gregorio, and this okay. is around um, highly rural veterans dying by suicide. Are there any insights or suggestions on how to approach the issue with extremely rural areas and reservations in terms of suicide prevention efforts initiatives? 
Well, first of all, let me say I'm not a suicide prevention expert. Um, <clears throat> I need to say that first. Um, I do understand, I do realize that we have <clears throat> a high numbers of Native veterans um, committing suicide in the rural areas, and it's very sad. <clears throat> um, we, we are trying to, with the PAC, or excuse me, the Strong Act, to open up other avenues of communication with our veterans at their facilities and so forth, where we can open up uh, just a simple talking circle where they can talk about their issues and their problems. Uh, but also keep in mind that we have the MOU, the Memor Memorandum of Understanding with IHS. So if that veteran can't find a VA facility, maybe they can find a CBOC or a, or a IHS facility. Um, also too, uh, reach out to the community of care office. Uh, there's other there's other ways of, of, of accessing mental health when it comes to suicide prevention. There you, you know, you have other ways of, of ha having appointments like virtual appointments, telephone appointments and so forth. And so kind of, you know, try to use some of those examples or those recommendations and addressing that. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to, to the, just the, the nation as a whole with veteran suicides, it, it's, it's, it's high and it bothers me. Um, you know, that uh, we need to do better. And um, I, I'll just, I would just like to add to that as well. Um, <laughs> just for those, uh, for your knowledge, everybody on this, um, on this meeting here, there is an, there's an effort underway right now to address this very issue. We were given uh, some presentations uh, months back on the, um, the jarring statistic that there's a 51% increase in Native American veteran suicide over the course of the last three years or so. So that was a jarring statistic to learn that. Um, and I am also um, on a team with some of the experts on the on the meeting right now. And what's happening right now is there's there's several listening sessions being conducted by by this team that's putting on this uh, webinar. So by it's a it's a partnership with VA and SAMHSA, um, and there is a Native American veteran suicide prevention initiative that is being really um, put together uh, in a very um, grassroots style. I could I guess you could say where we're going out to the vets, to the Native leadership, to the Native veterans, and we're talking to them. We're listening. We're listening to them about what they what their needs are and how that we can formulate a plan and an initiative that's our own, made for us, by us, that we can then try to power that out into our communities. Um, there's no really no easy answer for suicide prevention other than the best, the better that you can make connections um, as an advocate for the for those veterans and for your um, for your people who do that work, because uh, you just never know when it's gonna happen. But um, you can be as prepared as as you as you can. I so there's going to be a lot more coming out on that. Yes, go ahead, Roberto. I, I put my um, <clears throat> I put my um, I th I think it went to everybody. Did my government cell phone number go to everybody that I just typed? It, it looks like it said me to Dean. Um, I want to put my number out there because I want everyone to know. Let me retype this that if you are out there and you have a veteran that cannot find help, um, please uh, please reach out to me personally and I'll work with you in helping you find uh, services or help in your area. Uh, because the whole idea that, you know, people are out there, let me put this on a personal note. Last This last weekend, I had one of my, childhood friends who was my mother considered him a son he committed suicide by hanging and uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that um, there was no signs no signs whatsoever and so I want to make myself available to you by putting my government cell phone here on, in the chat so that if you have anybody out there that has problems or issues or needs to be addressed immediately, reach out to me. I'm sure that I can find 
the resources or I'm sure I can find them some help, you know. Uh, I don't want uh, anybody to walk away from this today uh, knowing what happened to my friend last week or on Friday, um, um, knowing that, you know, I walked away here and didn't try to assist as much as I can. So anyway, I digress. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that uh, very much. And and just overall, man, your wealth of knowledge, the history, the, your involvement in all these different uh, levels of VA. Um, as, as a native vet myself, uh, you know, I look up to you. I know I've told you that and I appreciate you for the good work that you do. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can collaborate moving forward. Now, I always kind of say that um, if we can move the needle just a little bit, improve the quality of life of our native veterans during our time doing this kind of work, then that's that's what we're, you know, mission to accomplish if we can do that. Um, and there's some really great things going on right now for native veterans. Um, you know, there's that tribal advisory committee I mentioned. NCAI does have a veterans committee so you can get involved in veterans advocacy on a national level. There's also the native um uh, National American Indian Veterans, NAIV, who just got their national ch federal charter. So what that essentially means is that they can, uh, we have an advocate at that level that your VFWs, your American Legions, and your DAVs have. We have a Native American-led organization that uh, has that ability to advocate as well. And they're kind of re reshaping their organization right now after getting that charter. Um, so like I said, there's there's some really good outlets, but there were some people that dropped some things in the chat about how to get involved. Please do send us a, send us a message. Um, I definitely, if it's not in my coverage area for the tribal advisory committee stuff, I will forward that on to the, the, the right people with kind of a warm introduction for you to get involved and to do that work. Um, so yeah, it takes us all. It take, we need more advocates in Indian country for our veterans. That's what I do know. Um, it, it, so it if does. you have a heart for that. It does. Help. And, and, you know, we, we, the Native American Heritage Month virtual events that I have in, uh, coming up in November and even Asian South Pacific that Ron Segudin, my colleague is having this month. Um, if you attend those two virtual events, we have the experts in, all these different areas like PACT Act, Strong Act, uh, uh, suicide prevention, uh, and so on and so on. And so I uh, really uh, uh, want to tell you to take the time to attend one of the events and you'll learn a lot of information that, uh, that we're, we put together to try to get out there to you and by having these events. And if anybody wants the information, just send me an email and I think Ron's is, let me, let me see here, Ron's is this week. So let me see what his is, his is Asian South Pacific. Uh, it's uh, May the 30th, Thursday at two o'clock. That's Eastern Standard Time. And then of course mine won't be till November, uh, but good information. It doesn't matter what nationality it is. The information is probably gonna be the same that we're gonna be uh, offering to you guys. Yeah, since since we did kind of turn to some discussion on suicide and suicide awareness uh, at the end of our presentation there, just also want to talk about the 988 press one for the veterans crisis line. So that is available. It's just 988 press one for veterans crisis line for anybody out there who isn't aware of that uh, resource. Also a additional re suicide prevention resources. Uh, for Native American and Alaska Native people on the 988lifeline.org um, under the Help Yourself Native Americans tab there. So I just want to make sure to give that, you know, give those plugs, share those resources before uh, we break. But we're coming pretty close to that time. Um, I, I just want to give one more opportunity to our honored guest speaker here, Mr. Gregorio Kishka. Kishkatan, do you have anything else you'd like to share with uh, with our um, attendees in, in closing here? Uh, what I would like to say is one thing I, I've always been wanting to say to a lot of people is go out and support your powwows. Go out and support the events that your tribal, uh, uh, your tribal nations put on and other tribal nations put on uh, because they really need your support and it's powwow season. 
And so if you have time or if you've never been to Pow Wow, uh, take the time, look at powwows.com and you can find a powwow and just learn about the culture, the history, the dancing. Uh, you know, sometimes they have events where they teach you how to make fry bread or bead work or whatever, but just go out and support your local native tribes. I agree. Powwow season is upon us. I have a few of my powwows in my calendar for me and my family to attend, and it's always a great uh, time to come together. But That's for nice. those who aren't as familiar, yeah, a great opportunity to go experience a, a little bit of our culture, right? That's our time where we celebrate. Families come together. Uh, honorings are happening. Specials are happening. Uh, and, of course, the great music and great food and vendors and all, a whole celebration. So um, I encourage you to do that. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share somebody asking for my contact information in, in the chat. I think I can share that. Can I? Did you? I'm going to share it in the chat. Maybe that our, our, our folks can share that. I'm going to share my email address. That's the best way to get a hold of me. But with that, yeah, I think um, we're coming right up on the time. I uh, once again very much appreciate it, everybody on the uh, on the webinar today for your interest in this space. Um, and collectively, let's keep it moving forward and continue to do that good work and move the needle for our native native veterans. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.